Kia ora koutou. I'm David Toombs, Director of the Centre for Theology and Public Issues at the University of Otago. Thanks for your interest in this presentation, which was given as a Faith Thinking Zoom event on 7th of April 2020. I'm going to be speaking about the new discussion paper, authored by Rocio Figueroa and myself, entitled Seeing His Innocence, I See My Innocence. Responses from Abused Nuns to Jesus as a Victim of Sexual Abuse. The paper was circulated last month, March 2020, and is available for download from Rocio's Academia Edu site. We hope to publish a more formal report on it later this year, and it will be the basis for a chapter in an SCM book next year. In this presentation, I hope to cover two things. Firstly, I outline some of the background and context of the discussion paper and I describe a few of the milestones in the project which it belongs to. Second, I share some of the key findings to the five questions we asked our participants, and I mention a few of the things that we have coming up or would like to do as we continue this research. We are currently in the third year of a three-year project, 2018 to 2020, When Did We See You Naked? We have, of course, taken the title from the parable of judgment, or the parable of the sheep and the goats, in Matthew 25, where Jesus identifies what is done to others as what is done also to him. You can see more about the project on the Centre for Theology and Public Issues website, under Projects. This is the research team, Rocio Figueroa, Jamie Reeves and David Toombs. Rocio is originally from Peru, but now in Auckland, at Good Shepherd College. Jamie is from the US, but now in the UK, at Sarum College Salisbury, and I'm from the UK, but now here at Otago, and it will be me who's speaking this evening. Rocio takes the lead on the interview work, and we are co-authors of a discussion paper that will be focused on this evening. Jamie takes the lead on other parts of the project, including our upcoming book in preparation for SCM. Another person I should acknowledge is Dr Tess Patterson from the School of Medicine, University of Otago, who is our project consultant on the interview work. Our international partners include the Ujima Centre, University of KwaZulu-Natal, and colleagues at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and at Stellenbosch University, South Africa. There are also colleagues and friends around the world who've been generous with their expertise and help. We've benefited from the excellent work done by the Shiloh Project, and I will say more about that a little later. Before going further, if you're not already familiar with the project and would like a quick overview on the issues involved, I would recommend listening to the interview on Radio New Zealand from 18th April 2019. The interview is about four minutes and you can then come back to the PowerPoint. So, this work is a long-standing interest of mine, dating back to the 1990s. It uses and adapts an approach to biblical interpretation developed by liberation theologies in Latin America and elsewhere. In particular, it uses reports of torture and prisoner abuse for a reading of crucifixion. The article which first set this out is David Toombs, Crucifixion, State Terror and Sexual Abuse, Union Seminary Courtly Review, 1999, and is available in the Otago Online Archive. In 2017, Rocio and I started planning for a research project which would involve revisiting the article in different ways during 2018. We wanted to explore how it might contribute to responses to the clergy sexual abuse scandal in different countries. Another important context would be exploring what it might say to survivors of sexual violence, including sexual violence during conflict, which was an issue I was working on with Elizabeth LaRue, at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Then, in October 2017, the Me Too movement erupted, and Jamie and I took this as an opportunity to reconsider the article also in relation to issues raised by Me Too. We chose the project title, When Did We See You Naked?, to link together the different strands of the project. One strand of the project has been translating and republishing the 1999 article in two new versions, both published under Creative Commons. One is a longer version, titled Crucifixion, State Terror and Sexual Abuse, Text and Context, 2018, available in English and Spanish. This includes a preface by me, 
in which I explain the initial reason for writing and some of what has happened since it was first published, which suggests its continuing relevance. There is also a critical reflection by the biblical scholar Fernando Segovia of Vanderbilt Divinity School. Professor Segovia was the chair of the session when the paper was first presented at the International Meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature in Krakow, Poland, in 1998. The other version is an abridged version, titled Crucifixion and Sexual Abuse, 2019. The abridged version was originally prompted by an invite to Brazil in 2017, which led to an opportunity to republish in, the Brazil, in Brazilian Portuguese, so it's available as a journal article in Estudos Teologicos 2019 and under Creative Commons, as shown here, in English, Spanish, French and German. A second and related strand of the work has been the interview work with adult survivors of sexual abuse. Prior to the current project, in 2016, Rocio and I did interviews with a small group of adult male survivors of sexual abuse. The group of eight participants had experienced sexual abuse within the church when they were teenagers and young men, linked to the Sodalicio movement in Peru. We asked about how the abuse had impacted them, and especially how it impacted on their faith and spirituality. Our report was published as Listening to Male Survivors of Church Sexual Abuse, 2016 available in English and Spanish from the Otago Archive, and it was subsequently published in the Catholic journal, The Canonist, in 2017. One of the things Rocio and I wanted to do in our new project, therefore, was to interview members of Sodalicio to hear how they reacted to the crucifixion article, since we had not included this area in the earlier interviews. We interviewed seven participants in the second series of interviews in 2018, and most of this group had also participated in the 2016 interviews. Their responses were published in our report, Figueroa and Tombs, Recognising Jesus as a Victim of Sexual Abuse, Responses from Sodalicio Survivors in Peru, 2019. This was originally in Spanish and English, and subsequently translated into Polish. Because it's a Creative Commons publication, so it can be used by others, someone else also translated it into Slovenian as part of work they were doing with survivor groups. So, to draw this together, the discussion paper in this presentation, on the right of the screen, is the fourth element in a connected series. The three previous reports are already published under Creative Commons and available through the Otago Archive. The discussion paper will be deposited there when it's finalised as a report later this year. In addition, there is also the earlier report from 2016, shown in the previous slide, which is relevant background to the project, but was actually part of an earlier project. I will come back to the discussion paper shortly, but before doing so, I want to mention a few other important events in the project in 2018 and 2019. In January 2018, I participated in a roundtable workshop at the Anglican Centre in Rome, organised by the Episcopal Relief and Development Agency, on church responses to gender-based violence. I then had a week in the United Kingdom as visiting professor at the Sheffield Institute for Interdisciplinary Biblical Studies, University of Sheffield. During my time in Sheffield, I co-presented a Shiloh Project lecture with Dr Jamie Reeves, titled Me Too Jesus – why Naming Jesus as a Victim of Sexual Abuse Matters, and a recording is available on the Shiloh website. The Shiloh Project is a collaborative project focused on rape, culture, religion and the Bible. Dr Katie Edwards, who's co-director of the Shiloh Project, was our very generous host for the lecture. During the time in Sheffield, Jamie and I were also interviewed by Kat Cowan of BBC Radio Sheffield. Kat asked us some really engaging questions about the work and why it was important. From Sheffield, we travelled to Birmingham and presented a similar lecture at the Queen's Foundation for Ecumenical Theological Education, hosted by Professor Nicholas Lee. In the lecture, we discussed this sign from Gustavus Adolphus Lutheran Church in New York, which was a response to hashtag MeToo. Jesus said, 
as you have done it to them, you have done it to me too. When I got back to Otago, I had an opportunity to write a short article in the Otago Daily Times at the start of Lent 2018 on the stripping of Jesus. There was also an opportunity in March to present a Lenten lecture at St Paul's Cathedral Wellington, linked to a workshop on the Bible and sexual violence by Professor Gerald West. Gerald was visiting from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, and resident at Otago for three months as the Dakar Distinguished Lecturer, working on the Bible as a site of struggle. Cathedral lecture included showing a short YouTube clip on the stripping of Vercingetorix from the HBO television series Rome, 2005. It's a largely fictionalised scene, but it gives a strong sense of the threat and menace involved in stripping a prisoner in front of an assembled group of soldiers. This can help to raise awareness around questions about what we notice and what we might miss when we read The Stripping of Jesus. For the Lent lecture, we also looked at the stripping of Jesus in Mark 15, 16 to 24. In 2019, working with the Ujima Centre, we developed a fuller contextual Bible study on the stripping and mockery in Matthew 27, 25 to 31, which we plan to use for further work with groups. Later the same month, Katie Edwards and I published a short piece in the online publication The Conversation, 23rd of March 2018, which featured the stripping of Vercingetorix and explained why Jesus should be recognised as a victim of sexual abuse. This piece then got taken up by other media in the UK and New Zealand and created a lively debate. One example of the media coverage is Kaya Burgess, religious affairs correspondent at the London Times. You might notice the genteel presentation of stripping in the image here and the clear contrast between this and the Vercingetorix scene in the Rome series. The following week, in a separate development, CNN had a long piece on CNN.com by John Blake, how Easter became a hashtag MeToo moment. Towards the end of the article, this discusses my article on crucifixion, state terror and sexual abuse. All of these events, along with the work of other scholars who have published on Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse, are discussed in this article, written with Jamie and published in the International Journal of Public Theology, December 2019. It's open access, so you're welcome to download and share a copy. In a chapter published last year in a book edited by Clive Pearson, I look in more detail at some of the stigma issues involved. This is also open access and is titled Confronting the Stigma of Naming Jesus as a Victim of Sexual Violence. One of the main motivations for the project is that we believe that this understanding of crucifixion is not just about past history. It also has a present significance. As academics, we're interested in getting the historical picture as clear as possible, so that is certainly important. But we want to do more than that. We believe that there is also a lot at stake theologically and pastorally. As this passage from Jürgen Moltmann's The Crucified God suggests, properly understanding the crucifixion is essential for Christian faith. It's not just about history. It's crucial for theology today. In addition, we think it can make a difference to the church's pastoral practice and how it treats survivors of sexual abuse or other sexual violence today. To understand this further, we wanted to hear directly from survivors of sexual abuse about how they responded to the article. As mentioned already, in 2018, we interviewed seven adult male Sodalicio survivors. Alongside this, we wanted to also interview female survivors. When the issue of nuns abused by priests became headline news in February 2019, it seemed appropriate to include this in our interviews. So we can now turn to the discussion paper. Seeing his innocence, I see my innocence. In 2019, Rocio interviewed five female adult survivors of sexual abuse, four of whom are former nuns and one is a current nun. Two had been abused as children by relatives and three had been abused as adults within the church. The participants are from Germany, France, Peru, Argentina and the Philippines. As preparation for the interviews, we asked participants to read a version of Crucifixion and Sexual Abuse 2019, or a short summary, which Rocio prepared. Rocio then held interviews with each of them for about 40 minutes. 
The interviews were then transcribed, translated and analysed and used to write the discussion paper. We had five interview questions. First, the impact that their vocation and faith had on their response to the sexual abuse. Second, whether they made any identification with the suffering of Jesus at the time of the abuse. Third, an assessment of the evidence in the article and their emotional response to it. Fourth, an assessment of the significance of Jesus being a victim of sexual abuse for themselves. Five, their views on the significance of this and for others in the church. For reasons of time, I'm not going to describe much of what they said, but I will just summarise briefly and share one quote from each participant, which we hope will make you want to read the full paper. Their vocation and faith was significant for how each of the participants responded to their experience. Maria said, Being a religious sister made it very difficult for me to channel or know how to direct the rage that I felt or even to allow me to be angry and allow myself all those negative feelings. On the second question, four of the participants made some connection to the suffering of Jesus, and one did not. For two of the participants, the connection they made was helpful. For one it was mixed, and for one it was negative. Lillian, who found the connection helpful, said, I asked the question, why me? Why has this happened to me? The answer that came to me was the picture of the crucifixion. God cries for me. God also suffers with me. For me, this is a great consolation. On the third question, Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse was a new idea to four of them, but one participant had recently come across it in a recording on the internet after it was presented by a speaker at a conference. Dina said, It is so strange that Jesus has not been considered a victim of sexual abuse. I think that it is because we have this whole victim-blaming culture and the idea that victims of sexual abuse have actually done something to provoke it. Picturing Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse makes it entirely clear that a victim is innocent. On the fourth question, one participant replied that it would have been very helpful in the past, but it had less relevance for her now. For one participant, it was not personally helpful to her or the survivors with whom she worked. The other three participants each saw the idea as helpful for them. Franca, who found it helpful, said, Yes, this thought is a help, a comfort, a source of consolation for me. On the final question, all of the participants said that Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse was significant for the church. It offered an opportunity for positive change in how the church viewed survivors. Lucia said, For the church, of course, because it can be a topic that is usually silenced. It was a powerful experience to hear the responses offered. One of the most moving statements came from Maria, and we have used it for the title of the discussion paper. Maria said, Despite saying to myself, you are not guilty, one part of me, in my innermost part, maintains my guilt and leads me to accuse myself. You could have done something to avoid the abuse. And then I have the experience and the knowledge that Jesus was innocent. That makes it easier to believe that I am innocent. It has been a beginning. Reading it has been like a relief. It is not just on a theoretical level. There is an emotional level that helps me to go into my heart. I love Jesus. I don't blame him. I don't say to him, you had to do something. You could have avoided it. Seeing his innocence, I see my innocence. In terms of what is next, there's plenty of work going on. We want to explore responses to the discussion paper and develop a wider debate. We hope to do further interview work and we'd like to do interviews in New Zealand as well as other countries. The Bible study work and collaboration with the Ujima Centre has been a particular highlight of the project and we hope we can use that to work with groups. There are two books in progress. One co-edited book, Jamie Reeves, Rocio Figueroa and David Toombs, When Did We See You Naked? Acknowledging Jesus as a Victim of Sexual Abuse, with a wide collection of international participants from scholars around the world, and an author book, which I'm doing, The Crucifixion of Jesus, Torture, Sexual Abuse and the Scandal of the Cross, to come out with Routledge. Thank you for viewing this presentation. If you would like to know more, please download the reports and or visit the project website and look out for future presentations and publications. Thank you.